Okay, well, hello everybody. Um, first of all, I would like to um, thank St. Anne's College, some very important people to thank. Um, I've got some personal thanks I'll do later, but some very important formal ones. I want to thank St. Anne's College, Humanitas, the Institute of Strategic Dialogue, and Lord Weidenfeld in particular for facilitating the Humanitas professorships. But most of all, I want to thank the Woodward Charitable Trust who financially make this film and television professorship possible. As I say, I have a few other personal thank yous that I want to do at the end, but for now I want to welcome everyone tonight. Um, not only a range of people here from Oxford University, undergraduates, graduates, tutors and so on, and from people in Oxford outside the university, for it does exist, um, but also film academics here tonight from uh, universities Bristol, Birmingham, Warwick, Reading, Hertfordshire, King's College London. We even have guests from Europe. Um, welcome to you all. The format, tomorrow afternoon at 2.30, um, we will have a masterclass session where Kelly will be examining some of her films in detail, we'll be attending to some specific sequences. So today will be a Q&A of more generality, but so we had something to ground our thoughts and situate the questions, um, I'm interspersing some sequences um, in tonight's session, uh, four sequences in fact from Kelly's films. I hope, I hope the session will break into two halves. First, Kelly and I will discuss some matters together, and then after about 40 minutes or so, we'll open to you to the floor. So having said all that, can we now give a very warm welcome, having flown all the way from the United States to be with us, the, the Humanitas Visiting Professor of Film 2014, Kelly Wright. Oh. Um, okay. Um, we're going to start with a couple of sequences, um, and, and Kelly, I'm going to move, excuse the clumsy shifting, um, uh, from two of Kelly's films. The first is from River of Grass, um, and if you don't mind, mind my little synopsis here of your, your film. Cozy, Lisa Bowman is bored in a loveless marriage. She meets Lee in a bar, and they go on the run from the police. Cozy thinks they've killed a man, which they actually haven't. She thinks, Lee thinks they've killed the man too, but he knows they haven't, or he seems to know they haven't. And in this scene, they're stopped at a toll gate, and Cozy realises for the first time that Lee has known all along that they didn't, in fact, kill uh, the man. The second sequence comes from Old Joy, um, where Kurt has encouraged Mark to go on a camping trip to try and find these magical hot springs, falls, that Kurt has already visited, but there are subtle tensions between them. Um, uh, and I think uh, that Daniel London, who plays Mark, muted response to Kurt's story is worth looking out for in this sequence. So I'm going to lower the lights and we're going to watch a, a, a clip from River of Grass and then Old Joy. It's very painful to watch her movies look so horrible. Yeah, I'm sorry about the loss <laughs> of quality there. It's like if you had a musician, you go, look, you're going to play for us, but the sound's going to suck. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, um, Kelly, with River of Grass, um, seems to be much, seems to be more obvious in it what its influences are. And I mean, if I name some, I'll probably get them all wrong now. No, I'm sure you'll get them right. Uh, it's look, very clear. Goddard and on a bit it ray no oh uh, well wrong. those aren't wrong weird they're well wrong. you know i don't know i mean there is this i mean what's the uh uh the godard film with the numbers uh uh i swear i mean it m i must have seen it but i at the time i i really think i didn't see it I, I didn't really look at Godard yet, but it seems impossible. It, it feels like a lie, but I, I really didn't, um, wasn't aware. But the next time I saw um, Badlands, I, I had to crawl out of the theater, um, you know. But every young filmmaker watches too, well, maybe not too much Terrence Malick, but <laughs> teaching film, I have watched so many um, young, f so, uh, you have, you have a good, you, from us chat, we've been chatting, yeah, you have a yeah. good sense of movie history. I suppose my question was going to be what role has influence played? Because the later films 
don't seem to obviously elude right. in, in, in well, certain Well, to, yeah. to, to big a role in, um, in River of Grass, I mean, um, uh, I was young. <laughs> it, wasn't it wasn't a criticism. It is a criticism. Yeah. No, to me, I mean, it's a criticism of, I mean, they're, the influence are too, are too obvious. Right. Um, well, I think because, um, you know, at that point in life, uh, uh, you're still so excited about the movies you've seen that, um, I don't know, as you get older, they just kind of, especially teaching film now, I've been teaching film for, you know, about 15 years. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, you know, films, they, you know, they become more a part of your life and I guess m you uh, find your own um, language and they just, uh, uh, you know, it just gets woven more into the fabric yeah. um, than, uh, and maybe also when you're, you know, it was the, the first narrative film I had ever made. And, uh, you know, it's probably just a, a confidence thing uh, at that point, um, you know, where you uh, assume, you know, you, you're questioning your voice every time you uh, set up the camera. Um, and I had a lot of resistance uh, from the person I was shooting the film with. Uh, about how I wanted to shoot the movie, and so you have to. Uh, I hadn't. I didn't quite yet have the voice to, um, you know, after you make a film and you live through the whole thing and editing it and trying to get it out and all that, you come to realize, you know, oh well, I if I'm gonna screw up, I prefer they be my screw ups and not someone else's, and you just sort of start to feel that your own voice is more valid as you as you go and uh, especially at that point there just weren't a lot of uh, women making films so there was no one you know it really felt like a boys club in 1993 and um, and so I think as it I went along I just sort of um, it's funny the end of that film oh we were talking about endings today yeah. it just occurred to me you know, the ending of River of Grass, uh, in, well, I shouldn't ruin the ending, but yeah. whatever. What, you know, it ends with her, <laughs> she, she fires this gun at him. But that wasn't how the script ended. That really wasn't how the whole thing was supposed to end. It was really my um, frustration that I felt in trying to uh, shoot the movie that uh, really, <laughs> <laughs> just probably wanting to shoot a man. Um, and uh, so uh, that uh, ending uh, just got <laughs> added on at the end. But, you know, you, you, you had to, like, where you put the camera, you know, you had to, like, debate every shot and justify it and maybe somehow, like, reference what you were doing. And the easier reference there was, the more valid the fight for where you wanted to put the camera. Um, and so those were things that I wasn't really expecting to happen and uh, that took place in the shooting, not, th you know, but still, yeah. I, the influences were and it, and large. And so that, pro in, in general, do you try and keep to a script, um, uh, or are you very willing to, right. to, to, be, to be responsive on set? What, what's the process right. there? Um, um, it's, oh, well, it's different. Um, I mean, also it should be said, you know, River of Grass was so much like this comment on the road movie. It's supposed to be about these, uh, you know, like how do you, how do the, the romance of the, the uh, rebel. Uh, in the time we were making the film, uh, Burger King's slogan was break all the rules. So it was sort of like now that the, it, it's so, you know, you're supposed to be breaking the rules. What does one do? So, you know, the, it was supposed to, that, you know, that w was another trap of the genre of not knowing when to leave it and when to actually be in it. And, you know, like these, these outlaws can't even really get through a um, toll booth uh, without the guilt of not <laughs> having the quarter. So, um, uh, but generally speaking, I, you know, because we shoot very fast, I, uh, really, really like to plan and, um, you know, have a storyboard and a shot list and reference photos and uh, spend a lot, a lot of time scouting and uh, 
and spend a lot of time on my locations before I shoot. But then, uh, you know, things will be so different on the day you're shooting because you don't really, you know, like I could stay in the desert with my viewfinder forever, but it's not till the day that I shoot that I'm going to have a wagon and an oxen walking <laughs> towards me. And that's going to, I'm going to have to adjust. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, so you try to stay open to uh, whatever comes with the location and shooting in Oregon, what usually comes is rain. And, and you know, you, you try to embrace whatever the world is going to give to you. But even it's easier to be spontaneous and flexible um, if you have a if you have a plan. Um, right. Yeah. Right. You mentioned that River of Grass was a road movie, but it seems I, I think there's a bit of road movie in all, all your films, even though yeah, they're, everything's even a road movie. Yeah, yeah, even yeah. though they're or traveling movies, even yeah. though they're they're wrapped in other genres. So Meat's cut off is a sort of western, but it's a story of a journey too. And Old Joy, they're on a road trip trying to find the springs, and Wendy gets stopped in one place, but it's a long trip to Alaska. She's right. she, she she she's she's on and River of Grass, lovers on the run and. So is road, what's the road? Yeah, but they're all, like they're really, they're road movies, but they're all really stuck in a way. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah. There's also cars, because in both, I don't know if it was accident, but there was like cars in, in them as well. Well, there's, yeah, the there's a lot of cars. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and Wendy's car know. breaks down, that's very, when she can't have a car anymore, that's crucial. And yep. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, and then there's wagons and, but yeah, um, yeah I mean, uh, well, I've sp I drive back and forth between Oregon and New York uh, at least twice a year, last time four times, because I, I still have the dog Lucy, and so she doesn't fly, and I teach in New York, and then I've been making films in Oregon, so there's this like driving back and forth. And, um, and I guess I first got into photography with family trips where we'd go from Miami to Montana uh, in the summers. And in college, I used to take uh, these drive-away cars. Uh, and these were the first sort of Super 8 films I made where you, uh, I don't know if they have something like this here, but back in the day, you, you know, it's like a wealthy person has moved and they don't want to take their car, so you drive their car for them. So you be like, well, we have a car going to Texas, so you take the car to Texas and then you hang out in Texas until they call you up and say, well, we have a car going to San Francisco. And I used to do that for the whole summer of my college mm -hmm. years. And um, so I spent a lot of time in the car, but um, yeah, I don't know. I don't find it all as freeing as it's supposed to be. Like there's a, um, there's a lot of, uh, anxiety with being on the road and uh, I never quite feel like I capture um, the romance of the carefree person on the road. <laughs> I, I know Justine Curlin, the photographer, I don't know if you all know her films, and we're often on the road at the same time and she's really hardcore and she has this van she lives in and she's a baby and she does it with a baby and she uh, sleeps in her van and you know, puts herself in these really precarious uh, situations, and um, I, w and you know, I'm always pulling into the best western and staying there for the night. I don't know, my like my road trips <laughs> aren't really, um, they're less romantic with every year. Every year that I get older, um, and they're, um, and they're. Uh, I don't know. Is Lucy, just is Lucy happy with the Best Western? No, Lucy yeah. doesn't like them anymore yeah. either. Like they're yeah. just both a hassle for us now. <laughs> and but they used to be a search and discover. But um, uh, but a lot of that has to do with how much the country's changed and how you used to drive and every state felt really different than the state you left. You turned in the local radio station. You looked for the local food, and now. Mm -hmm is a series of chains um, and there's one radio network the whole way and uh, it doesn't have quite the, um, and I'm old, and um, it doesn't have uh, the romance to me that it once did. What about um, 
lost. Everyone's always lost, lost didn't yeah. you? For, and the, it's amazing. There's the lost gun in River of Grass. There's the lost dog in Wendy and Lucy. The guys lose their when. There's the blank road sign in Old Joy. Meets cut off the word lost is in yeah. the tree. How, what's going on with lost now? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I am, uh, well, it's, it's strange because I did the last four films with a writing partner and a lot of the seeds of the ideas came from him or his short stories. And so, um, but he's a very grounded person that lives in one house and has two kids and um, likes being home. And I don't know, as much traveling as I do, like I'm always feeling that wherever I am, I'm supposed to be someplace else. So I like never quite know, you know, um, but I have no sense of direction at all. Like I'm lost always. I can't, I mean, I don't know how to read a map. Like I can't make a map make sense to me. Um, it, and so um, it, it is funny the things you see, the themes that come out over time that, uh, but it's not a plan. <laughs> so you, uh, so you, you're not saying oh, I, I'm doing another variation on people no, being lost. We're never yet. thinking about it. No. It's just a real coincidence. Oh. I don't know, or it's just like anything. Probably if you paint after you've been painting for 20 years, you probably look back and go like, oh, I keep painting my mother or whatever it is. You know, <laughs> um, same uh, thing <laughs> happens, I suppose. L land landscape, generally in your films, what sort of role does it play because it, 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 it um, the, the river grass is in uh, the Everglades yes, uh, but, but then there's all the, or the Oregon yes. uh, films and your, your films are often when people talk about films they say oh they're, they're in Oregon and uh, it, how, how important is the play? Right well the, the um, I guess we sort of usually start with an idea of a place the last film I made called Night Moves was takes place somewhat on this organic farm in uh, a place called the Applegate Valley. And we started with the idea of wanting to shoot on this farm. And Meek's Cutoff, I, uh, John Raymond and I, who I, that script was written by, we uh, went through the Oregon desert together uh, when we were making Wendy and Lucy. And I knew it was a, a landscape I wanted to return to. But, um, well, like with Old Joy in the Hot Springs, John had written the story uh, for a book of photographs by Justine Curland, and she had shot at Bagby Hot Springs, where we filmed. But so that's where the short story was set, and I went and visited the Hot Springs, and then I spent months driving around the country visiting Hot Springs all over the country which is how actually Will Oldham got involved because he visits hot springs and he was giving me hot springs tips. And then eventually I started just talking to him about being in the movie. Um, Wendy and Lucy, you know, this, the Walgreens in the short story is like a Walgreens John Raymond could see outside his house. It's like a block and a half away. And it just seemed so, just too easy to me. And so I, scouted like 39 states of Walgreens in the winter. And I was in Montana in a really big ice storm and I called my friend Todd Haynes, who's the person who introduced me to Oregon. And he made me describe, I was in a, in a Safeway parking lot, which is another kind of drugstore. And he made me describe what was different about that parking lot than the one that was down the street from John's house. <laughs> and I couldn't really you know, justify um, what I was putting myself through, except for that um, in the scouting, the scouting process takes place for so long, and driving in general is just a really great way to figure out what you're doing. Um, first of all, you don't have your mail, you don't have the issues of your life, you're just away. I mean, it's different now because you can carry all your crap with you and, and it follows you, but if you put it away, um, uh, you're sort of in between places. And, um, you know, so I, I'm Wendy and Lucy. Like, I went out looking for uh, this place that I would shoot the movie, whatever it was going to be.
but I was in Texas looking at Walgreens before I was in Montana looking at Walgreens. And I was uh, coming down the highway and I, a woman in front of me, her tire blew out and she went into a ditch. And I, we were in the middle of nowhere and I ended up giving her a ride. She had no money on her. She had like $10 and no shoes. And I ended up picking her up to give her a ride to go help her get her tire fixed. And uh, it was in that experience that I realized what the movie was about. And I was immediately just, you know, my good citizenship feeling of picking her up. And here I am heroically helping this woman. After about 20 minutes, I was like, oh man, like this is gonna take a long time. We're an hour from an exit and she doesn't have any money. And how am I, <laughs> like, what do I do with this woman? And what's my responsibility to her, basically? She's a complete stranger, but I saw her in need. And this question of what is my responsibility to her? was like me figuring out what that movie, the main question I wanted to ask in that movie. Um, and, uh, and so that was like a really big thing to figure out. And also just watching this woman and how she dealt with these crises that she must just because of her financial situation and she lives without any kind of a net. She was so unpanicked by it and she expected no help really, and certainly not from the police or the highway patrol. And just the way she dealt with her situation is like a, just not really looking at the big picture of the situation she was in, but just at the next immediate, like I need a jack. And then once I borrow a jack, I need a tire. And once I get the tire, like she just had a to-do list. And that's how Michelle Williams, uh, that's how we talked mm. about her approaching Wendy. Mm. So, um, so scouting brings so many things that you can take back to the script. And um, aside from figuring out what your shooting strategy would be and how you're gonna, you know, hopefully tell the story with images and sound and all those things. So, um, you know, my biggest challenge in teaching filmmaking is to that my students do research on their computers and there's no experience in that and it's and it doesn't lead to the possibility of a million other things happening to you um so uh yeah that's a long answer huh no it's good okay it's thank good. you for coming and <laughs> 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 know you know we've got yeah. you now um uh don't know if this is right, but this, I, I, I've got this sense that there's a worry in your films about characters are, who talk too much, who are loquacious, and, a, and you're drawn to characters that are quieter. Um, and the, 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 there's, in Meets Cotoff, there's a sense that, that speaking's arduous, that it, the very fact of speaking is tiring, it requires energy. And Wendy, Emily, Mark are all really careful in speech and what they say. They're not mute, but they're sort of muted characters. I, I find this makes us watch them very carefully. It, ha it has a beautiful effect. Is that th th there's a, there's yeah. a control in di dialogue and and people speak, and then there are people yeah. like Kurt and Meek who do who yeah 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean the for me, you know, the language of the film is outside the dialogue and it's where the cut is or what the shot is or what's happening really in between the lines. And, um, and so, yeah, the, there is a kind of filmmaking that happens now, especially since cameras have gotten lighter where the camera goes with whoever's talking, you know, and that to me is not, interesting um so yeah there i um i like that you know that the landscape tells the story or the people and how they deal with the landscape or just sort of what happens in between lines like that to me is where sort of the truth of the film is and um and where you can uh you know there's a lot of room for a lot to happen um it's where ambiguity can take place. And, 
and mm -hmm. there's and I mean in Meek's mm -hmm. cutoff, mm -hmm. they've been walking across the country for mm -hmm. almost six months. Like, mm -hmm. what would you feel like talking about at that point? You know, mm -hmm. I mean, like, <laughs> um, you know, you're walking yeah. for 12 miles a day in your. This is like before they even had right or left shoes. So you know, it's just <laughs> and it's hot and you know, um, so uh, yeah, it. Um, yeah. In, in, in that case, really, um, we were reading a lot of journals from uh, women that had made the walk, and uh, and the real conversation was about monotony, 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 and the routines of the day. And all the journals from the men and the women were so poetic when they were the first <laughs> weeks out. Um, God's country, and you know, and then as they go on, uh. you know, <laughs> it's just sort of like built the fire, cook the beans, everything became like a list, and for the mm. men, it's like made a left at the rock, walked <laughs> through the river, mm. like everything gets really stripped down, yeah, yeah. and so, um, and uh, yeah, and I guess mm. in Old Joy too, that's what happens. They, the further they get yeah, into the woods, the more sort of stripped down they get, and yeah. well, they get really stripped down, and then, um, but also, you know, physically and emotionally. Yeah, that's really know. good. I was going to, I was going to say that there seems to be a, 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 a real sense of honing in your in your films and a, a resistance to embell embellishment, and even the length of them. I mean, it may be because of budgetary things, but seventy two of them are seventy five minutes or there and thereabout. If, if only all films were 75 minutes. Yeah. Well, some, you know, <laughs> p some stories need more time. Yeah, These are sure. small <laughs> stories. I mean, they're based on, you know, short stories or novellas. They're, so there's, like, room to expand. They're not um, being crunched down from, uh, from novels. Yeah. And, and a yeah. lot of that space is in the, you know, in some of the stuff that, of that comes from uh, John Raymond's writing. You know, is you know he he writes. I mean, that's why I'd be drawn to his stories. You know, there's a lot of space uh, in there. And then when we're shooting, we're just always looking for ways. When you see something and you go like, "Wow, that's working," you. I mean, it's very hard to take lines away from actors once they've st <laughs> once they've started speaking them. <laughs> yeah, you, I realize we could do the scene without you talking. <laughs> it's never like a really popular <laughs> decision. Okay. Or, and I mean, writers don't like it either. Like, oh, okay, yeah, you, uh, my lines. yes, you, yeah. your big scene is, uh, turns out to be in a wide shot with your back to camera and you can't, we can't really hear you. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it makes, it's, it makes you, um, everyone love you. <laughs> Okay, well, we're, we're going to look at a couple more sequences in bad quality now to to to, to make to make Cal to make Cali squirm. Um, um, the f the first one's from Wendy and Lucy, which we we've, we've been talking about. Wendy's on a long trip to Alaska to find work. She's arrested for shoplifting, which causes her traumatically for me to lose her dog Lucy. Um, and, and in the, the, the sequence I'm showing, um, she still hasn't found Lucy and she's befriended a security guard. In the second sequence, it's from Meek's cutoff. Um, and it's a late scene in it uh, with a, uh, um, uh, a standoff uh, between some of the characters with the Native American. I can't tell you the whole uh, plot of uh, Meek's uh, cutoff, but let's have, have a look at those. Yeah. Can you still hear us? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so we've, we've we've got to talk a little about Michelle Williams. <laughs> um, she's an important part of two of your films. I think she's extraordinary in both of them. Um, I, as a just a humorous thing, uh, did you watch Dawson's Creek? Uh, is that a is that a touch? Because I, I was going to say, looking back to Dawson's Creek, if you'd asked me out of the four, Joshua Jackson. James Van Der Beek, Katie Holmes, and Michelle Williams, which one would make it? I think she would have been the least, and yet she's the one that's gone on to be a success, and it's probably because she, she, she's giving the, the most reticent, least obviously charismatic performance, and yet she's, done, she's given such good roles, in, she's done such wonderful performances in films. Wendy and Lucy, she's amazing. 
Yeah, it wasn't. I didn't watch Dawson's Creek. I didn't know. Uh. I mean, I'm not a TV. I love bad TV, whatever. But not about. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, that just wasn't my. Mm. But. Um, <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, she's. Um, she had a. Well, she worked with Todd Haynes on um, his Bob Dylan film, I'm Not There. She played um, the sort of Edie Sedgwick kind of character. And so, uh, and so that's how I got in touch with her. And she had just said that, you know, she wanted a role like um, Will Oldham had in Old Joy. And she, uh, so she came out to Oregon while we were shooting and she was, um, you know, Still then, she could still, you know, we didn't really, you know, have any uh, place to keep our actors when they're not working. She was sitting on the curb all day on the street side, and n I never saw her get recognized by anyone, so it was easy mm -hmm. to work with her then. And then, of course, in Meek's Cutoff, we're out in the middle of nowhere, so no problems there. Um, so, yes, yeah, she's very game. Um, you know, she her only thing was that she wanted to jump a train, and, it, and that she, so we... I was so, I had agreed that, you know, we would do this train hopping thing, which, is, you know, um, I mean, it was in the story that she would hop a train, but uh, it's kind of brutal down near the train yards. They really don't, you know, you can really get beat up jumping a train more than getting hurt on a train. You're, you should really not be in the train yards. And we, we kept going and waiting and waiting and waiting to try to catch a train at the end of our shooting days. And we actually finally got a, uh, uh, on the last day of shooting and everyone was leaving the next day, we just, I was like, we have to just fake it. We have to do the scene. And so we just snuck into this box car and we were shooting it. And then while we were shooting it, the train started moving. And so we had to like all jump off the train and get our crap so that she could jump on the train. <laughs> <laughs> and it all had to happen so fast. Um, it was our last shot on the last day. And it was quite exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, but she's, yeah, she's super great to work with. And um, we never really have any rehearsal time at all because the way the budgets are, it's sort of like I can talk people into giving me a certain amount of time and I want to use it shooting. So she, you know, Wendy and Lucy, she got there right before we started shooting. And, and same with Meek's Cutoff. We're well, Meek's Cutoff, we had actually a little bit of time. But it's usually about halfway through the shoot where Michelle is like, oh, I think I know who this person is, you mm. know, like, so there's this search that's happening while you're doing it, um, which is interesting um, as it goes. Uh, but uh, yeah, with Meeks, we had a week of uh, pioneer camp and the actors came out and we had, uh, they learned how to build a fire without matches and how to bake bread in the ground and um, all these sort of things they would need to know how to do and how to just maneuver in their outfits and how to drive the bulls. And, um, and then our production designer uh, had set up this, all the wagons, which were for different sort of classes. Each family, you know, came from a different sort of financial background. And the the things they would need for the journey and they sort of had to make their decisions of, you know, which, you know, what they would take and what they could fit in their wagon and learn how to pack their wagons and that sort of stuff. So it was sort of set up like a general store with them each being given an allotment of money that they could spend. Um, so some families have a tent and some families don't and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, so Michelle is game. And so in a film like uh, Meek's Cutoff where you have a, you know, nine actors, um, you know, it helps to have someone like Michelle who's really up for it all so that the other actors go like, oh, so we're not going to complain about how, <laughs> how hard this is and how, oh, you know, I, I, Michelle's doing it, okay. <laughs> and so it's really, um, you know, a really been a very great thing for me. Um, and she's talked a lot about how in those two films, you know, just dealing with the dog in one film and dealing with uh, oxen in the other film. <laughs> How much that, you know, it, 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 it's a different way of acting because you, you really have to just respond to, there's so much physicalness going on, especially with those wagons and you have these bonnets where you have no peripheral vision and you can't really hear through them. They're so dangerous. You know, you really 
have to be doing what you're doing or a bull breaks loose, you know? So, um, uh, so I think that for those reasons that she's, uh, those are the things she's talked about liking in, the, in, in doing these kind of um, physical, in the middle of nowhere, you know, we're really off the grid. There's no camera people following her. So for her, it's like a, you know, it's kind of a break. You, 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 you seem very patient while filming and get a lot together. You seem to be getting a lot. Patient, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. we're, I would, I'd probably, no one on my crew would really say that. <laughs> <laughs> Our final question before we open it up to the floor, I want to ask about politics, because um, there's, there's, there's always political awareness in your film, gender awareness, economics in them, um, the unconventional use of the Native American, the economic hardship for Wendy. And I was wondering how you balance that requirement with dramatic requirements or aesthetic requirements. So questions of obviousness or preachiness or tendentiousness being to issue movie-ish. Are these on your, minds, on your mind during the creative process? You think, no, nah, that's not quite, I've got to get this. Uh, um, so it's not just a politics movie or a Yeah, I mean, I think we don't think of them as political films. We uh, think of them as character films. And they are obviously, um, well, it's different over different times. I mean, when, we, when I was shooting Old Joy, uh, that was the first Bush had just gotten into office, and when we made Wendy and Lucy, had just been reelected, <laughs> and so you know there was a feeling of um, when making Old Joy, to just of the left completely disappearing and and also being so ineffectual, and so that was there. And then um, with Wendy and Lucy, there was this real outward uh, disdain, and it still exists somewhat, you know, just disdain for um, uh, poor people in the States, especially during a time of recession, you know, uh, this constant beating from the right of just like the laziness and the, you know, who's entitled to what, and I mean, still in the fight for health care, you see it. So, um, and then Meeks was, Meek, uh, Stephen Meek was like a real guy that, uh, you know, led a wagon train of people into the desert where he either had or hadn't been before. I mean, no one knows, you know. Um, he either got his map wrong or he completely bullshitted from the beginning. But in any case, he didn't know what he was doing. And so he was, uh, you know, so that all seemed kind of timely, uh, you know, <laughs> in the States. Um, and he was just a big <laughs> bragger. He was just... <laughs> Uh, you know, he was a big personality who bragged a lot and talked a lot, but didn't really, um, wasn't very functional. Um, so, of course, these are things, you know, the big ideas get talked about, but then um, we try to set them aside and really um, they have to kind of fade away, uh, you know, for the sake of... Um, just not really wanting to beat a drum for anybody and for the, you know, for the attempt uh, at art and to not, um, really not, tr to ask a question more that we can't, more than to um, say something. Um, and so, uh, and it's helpful, uh, it's, it was helpful in those films to have a writing partner because I'm, I will sometimes like throw something in like, ah, Really, and, and knowing that John will be like, yeah, you can't have that. You know, like, you know, you have that safety if you trust the person you're writing with that they'll um, take out what you, uh, you know, should you overstep, you can kind of monitor each other. Um, and then when we're making the films, I never talk about those things with the actors. I never talk about, uh, I remember when Michelle saw Wendy and Lucy at cons afterwards, she said, oh, I didn't know that was a political film we were yeah. making. Like uh, she had no, great. you know, so we never talk about those things with the actors. You just stay in the life of the character. And I think that that really helps. Um, and the, the film we just, that's coming out, well, it's coming out in the States next week, but it's called Night Moves. And that, the characters in that film are political people. They're these uh, environmental activists or extremists, I guess you would say. Rather. They blew up a dam, <laughs> so they're pretty extreme. But they, um, so, you know, this is the first, that was the first time we were dealing with actually political characters. So we really tried to set our 
agenda aside uh, and just go with like what would these imperfect people be doing. Um, mm. And so. The, na the Native American is really interesting because he, he resists the obvious ways we might categorize him or understand him, so either as an enemy, but also sentimentally as the friend or no noble savage. Yeah, um, uh, uh, he's, he's obscure and, and that un unknowable, and, and that makes it, it's a very challenging thing in the film. Right. He's such a mysterious person, he's yeah. really, which helps in life. He's like super hard to, he, I had, I, when I, I got, he did a reading and I thought, oh my God, he's so good, but he just looks like he would, you know, kick Meek's ass. So I can't, I can't, like I, I ended up casting this other man who seemed sort of more poetic and, and, um, and uh, he, that gentleman came to stay with us at the Horseshoe Motel where we were living. And on the <laughs> first night there, he um, felt that these spirits had talked to him and were haunting him because he was gonna play a Cayuse man, which was different than the tribe he was from. And so he was explaining this to me in the morning of the haunting of the, and of course, you know, <laughs> texting the cast person. Like, oh my God, <laughs> call Rod right there. <laughs> ASAP. Um, and so this um, dramatic switch had to happen. And Rod, you know, he spoke five languages and he went to learn. Uh, he's actually speaking Nez Pierce in the film because uh, the Cayuse language is um, gone. But um, he speaks five native languages as it is. He's a stunt man. And um, I mean, he would do these insane things on this horse off camera because there were didn't really fit into our story, but you know, he would, uh, you know, the stunt man would take like the whole day, like really like two hours getting the horse up on the hill. There's a shot of the horse on the hill far away. And then after we say cut, Rod bareback just rides the horse down the mountain with his hands in the air and you're just like, oh my God. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but he was so inscrutable. He was just such an interesting, warm, complicated, Un, like you could just never completely know him. So it, he mm. brought so much to yeah. that. Uh -huh. But I did, there were these things about like shooting the Native American with the bare chest in the mm. desert where it was really, really cold where we were shooting and he's almost naked. And so my, um, the first uh, the camera guy, the first AC is about Rod's height. So he would stand in and I would set the frame and then he would walk out and Rod would st set in and I would be like, oh my God, what a cliche this shot is. Oh, I can't like shoot this bare chested Native American against a, um, a blue sky like this from down low. You know, this is like channel six, uh, you know, <laughs> cowboys and Indian movies when I was a kid. There was just things that were like so built into the language of cinema, mm. like even any time if you have a Native American in your film, and it's a cowboy film, and you do a high shot of a mountain range, that you will automatically think that that's the POV of, like there's just these things in the language that I didn't realize till I was shooting of just like, oh my God, this is like yeah. absolute. If I set this camera here, it will read as, yeah. so it was just like trying to, but my only thing that I could fall back on, and I was really afraid of it at the time when we were shooting, especially that scene you showed, mm. we're just like, oh my God. Um, I, uh, he was just such a strange, I don't know, I'll never meet anyone like him again. He's never, I don't know if he's ever seen the movie. So I kept, he like to me helped keep it from being a cliche because right. he was just, just this, um, he had heard that, you know, Rod heard the film was gonna uh, open in Venice and he was so excited and he was gonna bring his whole family. And then he realized it wasn't Venice, California, that it was Venice, Italy. And he was like, oh, I'm not going to Venice, Italy. And he's just like, <laughs> and we never, we've never seen him since, you know? Um, he just goes, he's just like, he's um, an activist for uh, wild horses and he, uh, he's, really involved with uh, keeping wild horses wild. And he, he's a really interesting guy. So interesting. Um, thank gosh the other man was haunted and I got Rod. Right. Like that, you right. know, thank God. Cause I think yeah. I would have fallen into some traps 
right. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Right, let's uh, open it up. We have two roving mics, students, graduate students who are going to make work. Um, uh, so if you, that, great, but the for radar, a question here from... This, this work? Uh, yeah. Um, talking about what you want to avoid, I was curious about this kind of dramatic understatement that's so impressive, the way you don't make the drama explicit. And in a lot of independent films, there's the other um, kind of trap, which is to make the kind of non-event absurd or, or funnily non-eventful. And I wondered whether you're aware of not doing that, you know, like in a, say, in a Kali's making film, I mean, you, you would sort of so much not have the dramatic conclusion that it would be funny, but in your film it doesn't go, right. th in your films it doesn't go that way, so right. is that something you worry about? Yeah. Um, well, hopefully there's real things at stake and that would take care of that. There are other things I worry about as far as um, the thing of feeling like falling into a trap of like the independent film. Yeah. Of, well, the sh scene I stayed outside, you were showing at the Walgreens, um, which I can't, just can't watch. Um, you like, for example, like that, everything that happens on that location, I spent so much time in that parking lot and it was just a, a place I felt I never conquered, that beige wall and everything that happens there will always feel like capital I independent film to me mm. in a way that's that not in a positive <laughs> way, <laughs> you know, whatever independent means to you. Um, uh, so, I mean, I worry about more like visual traps in a way, um, and that being one that I feel that I'm mm. in when, uh, but the tone, I don't know, you know, you never know, you know, uh, it, part of it is performance and part of it, you're, you know, with old joy sometimes, I, you know, it w it w you'd be counting on like an emotional thing happen, like, oh, you know, it would be like, the, even the crew, it ended up that they had like these bets about the film. Like, the, everyone just thought that there was a movie <laughs> in there. And they were just sort of like, it was a great two weeks in the woods, but, you know. Um, but it, you'd be counting on like, no, I'd be like, no, I'm gonna put the sound of a branch breaking there, and that's gonna add tension, and everybody would be like, <laughs> okay. You know, and so you, there was this idea, there is sometimes the idea of like, is there anything here? And, um, I mean, when I was making Meeks and I really thought, okay, well, I'll never be allowed to make another film. I might as well, you know, not that I was enjoying myself, believe me, it was hell, but um, it, I, I, I just thought, it, it's more about the, sometimes I feel like we're on this razor edge of um, in just, uh, you know, we'll, what we want to get across, come across uh, if we don't want to, use any like kind of dishonest stimuli to mm. get it across. Mm. Not that you wouldn't, not to not use the, you know, uh, Spike Jones and I have this argument all the time, not an argument, a conversation. He's just like, those are all the tools that are in your toolkit and you can use them all. And I'm always saying to him, you know, I, you know, I just have one hammer on my hip. I don't have a toolkit mm -hmm. that I'm working with, you know. I mean, but it's, um, but sometimes I, you know, I guess, look, if you could picture it all completely as you wanted it, like even with casting, sometimes you could just picture someone in the role so much, it just doesn't even seem worth making it. You know, you have to be in a space of not knowing and not have that fear, I think, when you're shooting. And, um, and we have plenty of that, but, I don't know if I exactly, well, probably at some point I worry about that. I'm sure I have all the worries covered. Yeah. Um, but you're generally talking about tone, I guess, right? In a way? Yeah, I guess it's tone. I, I, I think it's sort of when the characters are allowed to become a little bit a caricature in their incapacity right. to reach dramatic conclusion. That is sort of a trope that many films yeah. fall into, and then it is very amusing. But it also becomes less dramatically serious yeah. and the characters sort of lose some of their integrity. Yeah. 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 They're not collapsing into something quirky right. all the time. I mean, I think the thing that uh, maybe if that's not happening, it's probably, um, you know, I, I really do like John Raymond's writing and I, and I don't 
ever feel that in his writing. Um, I always think there's um, s something there, and, and, and that's kind of sometimes the goal of the filmmaking, or I feel satisfied when I'm in the editing and I go like, oh yeah, that, I remember the first time I read, you know, that, that's, that's working. Um. Um, in the middle, the gentleman in the middle there. Oh, yes. the square, yes, yeah, the 4-3. Yeah. I'd yeah. like to ask Europe why they chose the rectangle that we all have to live with. I mean, um, I, <laughs> I really, um, I really love the square and I miss the square and I wish all films could be in the square. I mean, I just think it's a better frame. But for this, um, for these purposes, um, it was because so much in the script was, um, would, you know, it would be a line like, and then they turn the corner and they're surprised to find out. And, you know, I'm scouting and, you know, and I'd be calling John Raymond back at his house and be like, when I could get some cell phone reception, you know, I'm standing in the desert and I can see for 48 miles in front of me, which to them would be a week of walking. So, you know, um, there are no surprises in the desert, you know. Uh, so the square was, uh, really helped me to keep you with them in the moment they're in, because they're only walking like 12 miles a day. And so on the widescreen, you'd be like, oh, there's yesterday and there's tomorrow. But so the square also, um, <laughs> I thought it really helped the, the, the bonnets they're wearing, the, yeah. the women really, those are the true, bon like the true size bonnets you don't really see in movies. They pull them back so you can see people's faces, especially your star's faces that you can never see in the movie. Um, investors love that when you can't see the star's faces. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the point is they, they have no peripheral vision and I, and I really uh. was, you know, trying to, tell this Western from this other point of view. And I, and I felt the square helped in that respect too, aside from just solving this other problem for me. And um, at the time I was very attached to um, this Robert Adams book of photos, uh, The American West, which is really, you know, shows sort of uh, like wilderness, but with like the footprint of whatever it is, trailer parks or, but um, he also is using the 4-3 and you just, uh, you get s more foreground and you get um, more sky and um, so there was that and also it's a very good shape for the wagons, the shape of the wagons. So there was, I had a lot of justification in using the square. Mm. The downside of it <coughs> and why I think um, people don't use it more Gus Van Zandt's used it in some of his films in the past years, is that everything will always be released. Uh, when you're still shooting on film, there's already this compromise with the digital world. When you're color timing things and you're choosing darkness, you're either saying, I'm going for the perfection of my theatrical release, or my mind is on the long run and how people will watch this at home. You, you, there isn't a world where that all works together yet. Likewise, for the frame, people's televisions are mm. rectangle. Mm. So you have to, after you set your perfect frame for the square that you dream of, there will be someone tapping on your shoulder and saying, you know, but what's the 187? So you have to always be thinking in terms of two frames when you're shooting in the square. And so you really end up in this compromised place. Um, so it's quite frustrating um, because it, it's, you know, like all those Anthony Mann westerns where he's using that frame or uh, uh, Wegman's films, he uses the frame. They're beautiful. I, I just think it's a great way to shoot the desert. Mm. Next. Um, at the end, Ben. Yes. I, I should say that um, 
cinematographer for the film was showing the night moves and uh, for Meeks cut off is uh, Chris Blavelt, who's just an amazing um, operator and uh, cinematographer. And he, I mean, he's doing, you know, he's controlling the lighting, mm. the operating and, uh, and really, uh, he's, um, he actually started Meeks cut off with a different working with someone else. And th there was this constant um, struggle. And another thing that I didn't think about, like the shots we were talking about of the Native American, mm -hmm. um, was moving, how to move the camera through the desert. There, there's all this high sage and the terrain is really tough. And it's also like super rattlesnake area out there. So we, you know, we had this like sort of buggy which had wheels on it. And my thought was, uh, before I shot, like if it has wheels and I'm not just using, I really am not a fan of the Steadicam. So I said, if it has wheels, uh, even if the Steadicam's on wheels, it will still have this other feeling that I, you know, like from a dolly. And, um, but it wasn't true. Like when I started looking at the dailies, really just because if you had anything that was operated by a motor, it really changed the feeling of following the um, wagons. There was something that just felt, suddenly the women looked like they were in a fashion show. So Chris, when Chris got there, Chris Blavelt, uh, his first thing he did on the day there, he got everyone on the crew to get a shovel and we just shoveled our way a path through um, the sage for, and we laid down dolly tracks in the middle of the desert and we started pushing the dolly which changed the entire feeling of the shot so much and, and, and made it, you believed the period and, um, and just that taking out that motorized element of it um, was just a huge, uh, huge thing. Um, anyway, I don't know why I got off on that, but just, uh, sorry. That was um, strangely exactly the kind of thing I was going to ask. I know that sounds very... Uh, that's what I thought. That's what I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. That's what I was, I was thinking. Say, yeah. Just, yeah. yeah, right, right. right. Uh, the, the ratio um, question, you suggested that that was, uh, that was about keeping the perspective of the film more aligned with the, um, with the characters. Um, I felt watching the film this morning that uh, in those tracking shots, the feeling of the movement, you, you might have had it that the, the, the shots were shot from a rickety... Uh, caravan and that the, the camera when it was tracking the characters was going to be moving in that way uh, and that would have been very close to the character's experience something about the character uh, something about the camera's movement wasn't exactly aligned with the perspective of the ca with the characters do you see what I mean um well there's times when we're getting back and I, I'm praying you saw a print did you see a print no no, no. Oh. We're not, we're for shame saying, there's yeah. prints available <laughs> it's shot on 35 millimeter. You go through the hell yeah. of shooting on film and then everyone shows yeah. a DVD. Yeah. Oh. Um, it's a completely different experience on film, I promise. It really is. It's nice to see projected. Um, you know, because uh, there is this idea that the story is, you know, like sometimes you just have to get, you c in my opinion, you can't be in this completely subjective thing with them all the time. Like you got to get back and um, and look at them objectively and set them in the landscape and say, you know, here they are. This is um, just uh, just you know. Sometimes you just have to get back and uh, and I mean, moving the camera to follow everything is a very new thing. It's only because mm. the, if these cameras were really heavy that people are working with now, and it was a pain in the ass to follow things instead of easier, things would move through a frame. It's very beautiful to have things move through a frame and sort of acknowledge the frame. And um, it's a different, uh, it's a really, as you're saying, it is a really different feeling to let something move through a frame as opposed to following it mm. and um, I I mean I teach film and I know like the hardest thing to do is to keep people from moving their cameras that's all anybody wants to do because it's just you know I say if that I mean you know like in a Nick Ray film when the whole camera when the camera just has this one shot down an alleyway 
where they're moving the camera, which probably weighs hundreds of pounds, and it's probably a big deal to make that move. That move like really means something. It really there's really a power to it yeah, because true. it's bracketed by these stationary shots, and um, and so it has meaning. But it's just like it's like using a close up all the time. After a while, the close up yes. doesn't isn't a close up anymore. It's just the shot, yeah. and it doesn't um, it loses its value. And I and, and the same with a, a like a subjective kind of like to stay in the subjective all the time is I just think just becomes a gimmick to me after a while it just doesn't feel like it has I mean just for me like you have to like when does the door open for that like when it, do you seize that moment I don't um, I don't know it's just my take on it um, Haley, a question here. Hi, um, this is probably a, a successive question in a way. Um, the defining feature of your aesthetic for me is, is, is your uh, use of the long take, um, which sort of sets your films apart from Hollywood or American cinema in general, which of course is tending towards ever faster and cutting rates. Um, could you perhaps talk a little bit about your, your, your use of the long take and also the function of time in your film, time and and uh, duration. Um, as well, I'm just wondering if um, you've seen the films of James Benning and if those have had an influence on you at all because his use of landscape seems to be similar. Um, it's funny, I actually, when I was writing Wendy and Lucy, I was hoping that Sadie Benning would be Wendy. And um, I sent her the script before I talked to Michelle. I mean, whatever, I didn't think Michelle, I didn't know Michelle Williams would want to make that movie. But, um, uh, I sent her the script like the week her dog died, and she was like, ah. <laughs> 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 um, but, uh, which is just a coincidence. But um, I know uh, James' films, and I teach with Peter Hutton, the landscape, who's sort of from the same school landscape uh, uh, filmmaker. Um, yeah, where I teach, it's really more of an avant-garde program, and I'm sort of as narrative as they can swallow. Um, but uh, so, um, yeah, I've been exposed to uh, those sort, that sort of shooting and that use of time. Um, though the last James Benning film I saw was like of a tree for, and it was a really nice day outside and I was in Oregon and I was looking at this tree and I was like, okay, I'm gonna go outside and be with a real tree. tree. <laughs> 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 um, but um, yeah, I, I, there are some of his films that I'm, really fond of, but uh, gosh, you know, I don't think of the pace of my films as being like a James Benning right, film. Right. I mean, I, I mean, there are things that are being belabored in Meek's Cutoff because, uh, you know, the whole idea of the Western is traditionally about these, about big moments, endlessly big moments, big moments, big moments. And, um, and if you read, the journals of, especially of the women, they really talk about the drudgery of it and the repetition and the monotony. And so I was hoping to sort of sh give this point of view on the Western that I felt like was sort of missing. And so in that I really wanted to use time and, and also labor and process of doing stuff. Um, I mean, those sort of things appeal to me, which, you know, talking about your influence, uh, like to me, nothing more satisfying than, um, you know, man escaped. There, I have the whole, I, I've been told what the film's about, <laughs> and now I can watch um, a man <laughs> escape, you know, and build the, take his bed wire and, you know, <laughs> twist it around, and I, I, I just really like process, and, um, and so that sort of starts to define uh, time I in a lot of ways and and all these films that I've made all take place they're they're just sort of like you dropping in with people for a week and then they go on their way and so um, if you're just gonna cover that span of time like I w don't know how, like how I, if I could get my head around like the epic and then ten years <laughs> I mean I want to do the calendar pages 
blowing out the window. I want to do that yeah. shot, believe yeah. me. But but I don't know yeah. like what you do beyond yeah. that. Like I don't. Um, uh, so. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that sh like I to me. Things feel like when I go, I just to current films just or especially if you go sit through like coming attractions, it's just like too fast, too loud, you know. Um, I guess it's just everyone's own rhythms ultimately, you know. I'm really fond of films, you know, like Nick Rogue films and, and the way he uses montage and I, I don't ha like I've tried mm -hmm. to like see if I could, I just have like a super linear brain, so it's like point A, da, 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 you know, so I, working with what I, <laughs> <laughs> my own uh, clock, I guess, to some degree. Um, it's not some, um, I don't know, yeah, it's just, I guess, I don't know, it's just what is for me, I don't know. Um, one at the back there, just hand up, can you put your hand up so that my, so that's it? Um, I'm just wondering, um, I've got two questions about the mix cutoff. Uh, the first one is about the ending. Um, I'm curious, the, the ending, why do you choose to end up like this? Or it's your choice, or editor's choice, or producer's choice? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and then the second one is about the point of view of uh, the mix of cutoff. Cause the title in the in for this film is is about Mick, but the I think the the main point of view in this film is is something from that main actress. It's uh, Michelle's character. Yeah. So why do you choose yeah. this title? Um, this is what the male actors wanted to know once they realized how I was shooting the film. <laughs> <laughs> If you think you are surprised by that, imagine how they felt. <laughs> um, when you, uh, yeah, when the day is really short and, um, and the days are really short because of the mountains, you lose the sun sooner than you want to. And we're shooting actually where the real wagon train got lost. So we're in the, m we're in the smallest town in, in the United States uh, called Burns, Oregon, and then we're traveling two hours off any roads, just in dust, like everyone has to wear bandanas in the van. You're covered in white sand before the day ever starts. And, you know, your name is on the title and you have all the dialogue. And then, you know, as I said, then, um, you know, you're, uh, the cl your back is to the camera and you're <laughs> in a wide shot. And the rest of the day are close ups on the people that don't have any lines. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's, um, yes, well, that's the tricky thing, right? But, um, but it is, uh, it is, it is, it, it is the story also of, you know, they're in the dilemma they're in because of me. Um, but, oh, the ending is such a long story. Um, the, nothing, I mean, nothing, I mean, I, make my living from teaching. And so these films are being made in a way where if I have complete creative control or forget it, I'm definitely not in it for the money <laughs> or I'm a fool. Um, but um, so what I get is I get final cut and I get final, s I edit the films myself. I, you know, say the script is done. I have a lot of freedom, but where I don't have freedom is in time. You know, we, we move really quickly. Um, the ending of the movie was a point that John Raymond and I did not really agree on. I never really understood this certain thing that happened at the end of the film, something that uh, the Zoe Kazan character says. And whatever, John didn't want to deal with it. He was like, no, he, or to him it made sense. And to me, it didn't make sense. And, and we kept pushing it off and pushing it off, dealing with it, um, or I did, um, until 
I was out, you know, then suddenly it just snowballed and I was making the movie. And uh, a huge mistake is, and I think I've made it on every film I've shot, where um, you don't want to shoot your last scene on the last day of shooting. That's a horrible idea. Um, you have no recourse if things go wrong. But for various reasons, like in the case of Meek's Cutoff, that tree, I fell in love with that tree. I found that tree. And it was in this one area I wasn't allowed to shoot in. And I mean, we drove for days and days searching for trees, but like here this tree was on this land I didn't have permission to shoot on. So we were gonna steal the tree shot with like wagons and horses. And so anyway, if we got in trouble, that's why I got pushed to the last day. So the night before I was thinking, God, I hope Zoe does not ask me about this scene. Like, if one of my students did this, I would murder them. Like, if it doesn't make sense to you in the script, it doesn't work on film. And I, I just hope she doesn't ask me about this one line. It was really just a line, not the whole ending of the movie. But it was sort of a line that triggers the ending. And, uh, and it was really cold that day, and we had an impossible day. Like, if we were on the top of our game, like we had never been before, there's still no way to make this day. You know that going, it, it's such a defeating feeling going into a day like that. Um, but people have just had it. They're going home. I can't keep anybody there. It's just been such a hard shoot. And people are counting the hours till they get on their plane and go back to their lives. Um, plus, I don't, I don't have the, the oxen. I can't afford to keep the animals for another day. So we get halfway through the day and uh, everything's working out. And it's just like, wow, we're making our day. This is incredible. Um, and then we have a location change and we're going to shoot the last scene of the movie for the very last thing we do. And it's been very cold, so Zoe's been in the camper all day long. And we go to do the scene and my crew is just all in sync and all ready and they're just like gonna, ready to just kill this ending. Here we go. And the actors get out, and um, and you know some of the some of the guys already like have had it with me because they're already the western they came to make is not the western they're now involved in. <laughs> so I'm not like I'm already not starting from a place of popularity. Um, and they get out, of, and Zoe looks at the tree, and she just says, "This line won't work here. I, I what is this line?" Kelly, I don't understand this line. Oh, oh shit. <laughs> like, it's like my worst nightmare. And also I realized like, you know, I'm looking, I'm talking to her and she's like, I know you're not even thinking about, all you're thinking about is the sun behind me. I know you're just looking at the light. <laughs> Zoe, no, it's not true. <laughs> tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> you know, you just want to say, but I already made this mistake and said it to Michelle once in a tight moment, and I'll never say this to an actor again. You know, you just want to go like, come on, just say the fucking line. <laughs> you know, <laughs> can't you hear an actor say the line? <laughs> you don't feel it. All right. Um, you know, but of course you can't say that. Um, you, uh, you know, uh, you can't say pretend. You know, of course it's. You know, she's trying to respond to something. She's trying to do her job. Um, well, so, oh boy, what a moment. Like the crew, you just feel the, the momentum just being crushed. <laughs> and, um, and the actors are just like, Zoe, don't, you know, this is what's important. It's about the acting. Don't, um, mm -hmm. don't get caught up in, don't in the frenzy of filmmaking. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so in a pinch, uh, and she, you know, she was right. I didn't know what the line, uh, she, I, it was totally my fault. Um, but uh, heroic Paul Dano said, you know, I'll, I'll say the line. I get it, I'll say the line. And then we just started sort of reworking the scene and figuring out as it should be and getting to the place where the actors could feel comfortable. And then they felt comfortable and then the sun was gone. Um, <clears throat> so we started shooting the scene with nine actors and uh, six oxen, and uh, a donkey and a mule. And then the sun went down, and everybody went home. And uh, 
I went home without an ending. And I went home and I cut the film. And I, mm. I, oh my God, just to live through that shoot and go home without an ending, I can't even tell you. Um, I mean, that was a really physically hard place. The day, you know, you'd get out there and then you really, uh, the animal catcher comes and kills, you know, spends time catching rattlesnakes so that the actors can come out <laughs> and do the scene. I mean, it was, it was just so, you know, there's a reason that Westerns use horses and not bulls. Mm -hmm. um, bulls are wild animals um, and they don't move backwards. So after you do a take, you can't back them up. <laughs> you have to move to a whole new area and start over and re-block everything because you, the time they, you take them around and get them back, they've destroyed the landscape. So um, anyway, this was how Meeks ended. And it would never have probably been an ending that would have satisfied you. It was never a conclusive ending. It was always an ending of, you know, is the tree dead or alive? Uh, basically, like what o is over the hill depends on who you you are. If somehow you haven't read American history and you think over the hill is some fantastic ending for the Native Americans, good for you. <laughs> you know, but you know what's over the hill is really about uh, you, the viewer. Nevertheless, I didn't even have my open ending ending, um, and I, you know, as I was cutting, I, you know. Todd Haynes, who is you know, the executive producer, and always can find the positive outlook on anything. He's a very positive person. I, say. I just remember having dinner with him at my birthday party, which I couldn't enjoy, because I was just like, I don't have an ending to my movie. <laughs> and he was like, you really don't have an ending. This is like, you know. And I was just like, oh. So um, basically, Michelle agreed to go back out there with me. Um, so I had Michelle and Rod Rado the Native American actor, who said they'd go back, and no animals. So it was this puzzle of how to finish a scene that you started with nine people and all these animals and end it with two actors. Mm. And, um, and under those conditions, my god, what an ending. No. <laughs> 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 um, so, and in a different season. OK, so anyway. Uh, that's, um, but I was saying to, uh, telling him that, you know, occasionally, you know, we do get, we get the DVD comes back to us with a note, like, my DVD didn't have an ending on it. I could go on listening for a yes, long time. Sorry, more, sorry. But we no, long story. No, 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 that was a, 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 a really revealing, a very good story. Um, uh, but we, we, we really have to stop now. Um, I, I um, just want to tell you, there, there are going to be drinks outside for everyone who's come. Do come back to the masterclass tomorrow where we can hear more of these things uh, more directly in relation to the sequences. That's at 2.30 tomorrow. Just before we go, I need to personally thank a few very important people who've been doing everything in their power to make this event go smoothly and make things easier for me. And that's Peter and Natalia at the ISD, Sarah, Hannah and Victoria at Torch, Emma and Deborah in the principal's office, Ben and Ian from IT, and especially Lisa Simmons, a deputy bursar and a team. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming and contributing. And thank you, Kelly. Yes. Thank you.